All right, everybody, I think we're ready to begin. So good morning, colleagues. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program, my name is Asa Margolis, and I'd like to welcome you to our webcast this morning. So in case you all forgot what you signed up for over the next uh, hour, hour and 15 minutes or so, we're gonna be talking about the transport of the patient on inhaled nitric oxide. You know, like so many therapies, uh, including heated high flow nasal cannula and proning, we have COVID-19 to thank um, for bringing a therapy that so many of us had relatively little experience with and shifting it much more to the forefront of our management of some of the most critically ill patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure. And because of that, we wanted to share our experiences from identifying the need to be able to offer this type of therapy to some of our patients through the development and rollout of a competency-based education and training program, as well as discuss some really important lessons learned from one of our transports involving a patient who required INO therapy. So that brings me to our uh, outline for today's session. So we're gonna do things, uh, if you tuned into our prior webinar a few months back on proning, um, in that case, we presented some material up front and then we went through a few case reviews. We're gonna do things a little bit differently this morning. So we're going to take one case. We're gonna introduce that case up front. Um, we're then gonna stop and review some ARDS physiology, uh, talk about INO therapy, get into a little bit of a literature discussion about inhaled nitric oxide, and then go from essentially how we went from concept to implementation and everything in between. And then we're gonna bring it back to the case to conclude and talk about some lessons learned. Um, with respect to questions, so throughout the webinar this morning, please feel free to put all your questions in the chat. Uh, the panel who I will introduce momentarily, will try to get to them uh, as we're able to. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, there will of course be additional time to make sure we get to your questions. Hey, sir. Um, there's also a Q&A um, box, that, so you can actually use the Q&A box for questions regarding uh, the content, and we can answer it there, or you can use the chat um, for, for if, you, uh, if you can't hear or anything like that. Perfect. Thanks so much, Sean. Uh, so again, my name is Asa Margolis. I'm the medical director of the Johns Hopkins Lifeline Critical Care Transport Program. I am joined by two of our other medical directors, Dr. Ruben Troncoso and Dr. Eric Garfinkel. Uh, we also have Sean Troutman joining us this morning. Uh, he is our nurse manager, uh, Ben Kitania, who's our nurse educator. And then we also have Megan Graham from Respiratory Therapy, who, as all of you will shortly see, uh, has been an invaluable asset to our team and to the development of this entire program. Uh, we're also joined by three of our nurses, Sarah Beth Burton, uh, Sam Matei and Scott Lassan, who will be presenting the case that they transported uh, a short time ago. As far as disclaimers, all talks have disclaimers. We do as well. So a reminder, the material that we provide to you is a summary and not meant to be a comprehensive review about everything related to INO therapy. Um, please remember, uh, all of you out there, that the information that we provide does not and should not supersede the recommendations uh, and decisions of either your hospital or EMS agency leadership or medical director. And uh, we have no financial conflicts of interest. We, in, we are not endorsing any products whatsoever. Uh, so please keep that in mind as well. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to Scott Lasson uh, to introduce our case. All right, good morning, everybody. So as you can see on your screen, this is a case of a 53 year old male patient uh, height and weight are there, 68 inches, 91 kilograms. His BMI is 30.5. Really not much for a past medical history, uh, diabetes and hypertension. His main problem was he was diagnosed with COVID-19 um, and then progressed into hypoxic respiratory failure and ARDS. Our Lifeline team encountered this, encountered this patient on day 18 of his illness. He, let me pull up my slides here was having increased oxygen requirement over the last six days prior to our encounter with a pretty significant clinical deterioration over the preceding 24 hours um, before transport up to and re requiring uh, aggressive mechanical ventilation, vasopressors, neuromuscular blockade, and prone positioning. Uh, 
our team was dispatched with the information knowing that we would potentially have to transport this patient in a prone position and or start INO therapy on him. So we dispatched appropriate personnel, including a nitric oxide super user, which was Sam Mate, and uh, also additional manpower for the proning per our protocol. Great, thanks so much, Scott. So, you know, that really turns it over to where we come into play. So the outside facility realized that this patient uh, needed additional therapy and additional care. And at that point, a call went to our communication center and our Lifeline communication center individuals essentially triaged the call. And one of the things they are looking for is whether or not the patient who we're going to pick up and start caring for, uh, as Scott mentioned, is going to need uh, potentially proning or inhaled um, vasodilator therapy. So when we go through this screening process, there are a few things we need to know. And number one, whether or not the patient has been prone within the last 24 hours. Additionally, we uh, gather information so we can calculate and utilize a P to F ratio. Uh, and a P to F ratio of less than 150 is an indication for us to uh, roll out and consider our prone therapy as well as INO. Additionally, if the patient has an FiO2 of greater than 70% and a P greater than 10, uh, that is another indication. So when we first started this process months back with essentially just proning, uh, a call would be placed to the uh, medical command physician as well as one of our supervisors on call to sort of work through this and determine uh, whether or not these resources needed to be deployed. Ultimately, we have gotten to a point now where this has become automatic. So if our comm supervisors and our comm call takers determine that the patient meets any one of those three criteria, we automatically dispatch the prone pack, which is essentially all the material we need to prone the patient, an additional crew member to be able to prone the patient safely, as well as our INO therapy. Uh, I think a key thing to keep in mind is just because we dispatch this doesn't mean that we're obviously going to utilize it. As many of you know, when you arrive on scene, uh, the information you were initially dispatched with uh, is different than the information you find when you arrive. But the key point is we just want to uh, limit the time um, that we are spending gathering stuff. We just want to gather stuff and go and make the determination and empower our clinicians to make the determination on scene based on their evaluation of the patient. So again, we place a tremendous amount of emphasis on optimizing the patient prior to making the decision whether or not proning is indicated or INO may be indicated. Because while it can be done safely, there are associated risks and adverse reactions with both of those. So first of all, with respect to ventilator management, we want to optimize the patient on the ventilator. We want to ensure protective lung ventilation strategies. Uh, in certain cases, accepting some level of acidemia from respiratory acidosis. We want to optimize oxygenation while integrating tools uh, with respect to patient compliance on the ventilator to determine their PEEP of best compliance as well as consider metrics like driving pressures, again, to make sure they're optimized in terms of their oxygenation. We want to be able to sedate the patient and make sure they're effectively sedated. And if necessary, at that point, do chemical paralysis and pharmacologic paralysis to make sure that we're synchronizing the patient and we're able to allow the ventilator to work for the patient. Additionally, we're making sure that the patient is as hemodynamically stable as possible. But even after all of that, proning may still be indicated as well as inhaled pulmonary vasodilator therapy, of which nitric oxide is one of them. But again, these add to the ability of our clinicians to bring effective therapy to the bedside. And we empower them to do so by just giving them the tools, ensuring that they're able to optimize the patient, and then deciding based on the patient's clinical presentation at that time, whether proning is indicated, inhaled pulmonary vasodilator therapy is indicated, or both are indicated. So with that said, we're going to return to the case to learn a little bit more about our patient. Great. So when we encounter this patient on uh, this day, on day 18 of his hospitalization, 
uh, he was having increased hemodynamic instability and worsening hypoxia, and that prompted the request for him to be transferred to an ECMO center. Unfortunately, there weren't any ECMO beds available, so we there was a decision made to transport him to a facility that could at least bridge him um, on inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. To complicate things, he was previously prone, and then the morning of transfer, uh, before we got there, he had to be emergently supinated due to a presumed cuff rupture of his ET tube, and they did a, a tube exchange. Interestingly, the same facility was reporting that they had several of these incidents occurring over the last week or so with patients um, with these presumed cuff ruptures. Uh, but every time they did a tube exchange and reinflated the balloon, all of the balloons were intact. So there was clearly something going on in this kind of patient population uh, that really complicated things as we went forward. So here's the vital signs that we had for our patient when we arrived, as you can see on your screen. He was supine on our arrival. Vital signs weren't too bad. Heart rate was 90, blood pressure 108 over 69, MAP of 82. He was synchronous with the vent breathing at a rate of 30. SpO2 was 90. He had, I believe, a 7.5 ET tube in place that was placed that morning, pretty fresh. On volume control on the ventilator, volumes were 420. PEEP was 15, rate was 30. On 100% FiO2, minute ventilation was about 12 liters per minute. As Sam and I and the transport team were en route to the facility, we called ahead and spoke with the bedside nurse and had her redraw a blood gas for us just so that we would have some uh, fresh data when we got to the patient's bedside to help guide our care. So his pH on this recent blood gas, since he was supinated and on the vent settings you can see, uh, pH was 7.32, his CO2 was 76, PaO2 was 50.6, uh, bicarb was 34, and his PF ratio was 50.6. Um, and as you, as Asa talked about before, a PF ratio of less than 150 is an indicator for us. And you know, his was 50, so it was, he was not oxygenating or ventilating well at all. Uh, sedation, he was pretty well sedated um, on fentanyl at 400, propofol at 50, Versed at 15, and he was paralyzed with Nimbex at a rate of two. A little bit of blood pressure support. Uh, the Neo was at 0.75, and he was on an amio drip. Um, Sam, you have to jump in here. I don't really remember. I think he had some runs of um, AFib or something previously in this encounter, so they kept him on some some amio. That was exactly why he was on the amio. He had uh, uh, AFib RVR uh, runs of AFib RVR. He was out of it when uh, when we got to him, uh, but they wanted to continue the amio. And so, Sam, are you taking this part? Yeah, yeah. So this was sort of the the game plan was to um, we got to the bedside, uh, saw all that information uh, that Scott presented, and um, did a quick medical consult with one of our uh, one of the MDocs on uh, discussed sort of what the game plan was um, and basically wanted to continue what we, what we had found him on. So the goal was to going to be to continue all the infusions uh, pretty much stay the same uh, because of the drop in his PF ratio from about the mid seventies uh, prior to them uh, supinating him. Um, the decision was made to uh, reprone him for transport. Uh, we discussed that with uh, medical command. They said, "Yeah, let's give it a shot. Uh, let's reprone him, and if that doesn't improve his uh, oxygenation, then we'll start the nitric." Sort of that was our that was our game plan in in a bit of a stepwise fashion um, was to do that. So we prepared everything. Um, if you've seen the, the prone webinar that we did previously, uh, we get into sort of what all our preparations are, ran the checklist for uh, a supine to prone uh, transfer, which essentially we set up the stretcher, put it next to the hospital bed, and then we prone them from the hospital bed onto the stretcher. Uh, and I would encourage you to go back and uh, kind of look at that 
uh, webinar and we'd be happy to share sort of what our process is there. Um, so we did all that, uh, proned the patient onto the stretcher. Um, everything seemed to be going okay uh, as we uh, made the transfer. Um, everything was intact, he was looking good. And uh, the only thing we ran into was that uh, this gentleman had a big giant melon head and uh, like pretty bold, like upper, his shoulders were very large. So he ended up when we ended up proning him, um, occluding his IJ. Um, so we went through some troubleshooting there uh, as we put the drips back on, uh, changed around his arms into sort of different swimmers position to the point we were actually going to leave both arms down to try and kind of alleviate that occlusion. Uh, we went as far as to do um, some kind of big strips of tape across his back to kind of displace some soft tissue down and back uh, in, a, in an effort to uh, display some of that soft tissue off of his IJ. Uh, kind of got that sorted out. Uh, everything seemed to be going okay. Uh, we were to get up, able to get our infusions running. Um, and spontaneously, maybe five-ish minutes, uh, five, seven minutes after sort of doing all that troubleshooting on his IJ, discovered that he uh, developed a big giant cuff leak, um, a cuff leak that was large enough for me ac to actually hear it over the papper. The low minute ventilation alarm started going off on uh, the bedside ventilator that we had not transitioned to the T1 at this point um, and looked up and his tidal volumes were less than 100. Uh, I think at one point I looked up and they were like 40. Um, additionally, uh, the low peep alarm starts going off. We had essentially lost uh, seal so we couldn't maintain peep on him subsequent drop in um dip in his uh sats so we quickly sort of assessed the situation and immediately made the decision to emergently supinate him back onto the bed um disconnected all the lines kind of went through our process for emergent uh emergent supination emergently supinated him back onto the bed and the cuff leak went away um in the process of the emergent supination and talking to the, the sending staff, got the docs involved and said, hey, somebody's gonna come back, have to come up here, assess this ET tube, potentially put another one in. Uh, we thought maybe he had popped his cuff. Um, the facility had mentioned that they had changed out a lot of cuffs re recently or a lot of ET tubes. So I wasn't sure if maybe they had a bad batch or I, I don't know exactly what was going on. Um, but that wasn't for us to sort out at that point. So uh, docs showed up with uh, equipment and they thought that we're gonna have to reintubate this guy, but uh, spontaneously the cuff leak goes away when we, when we roll him over. Um, reconsult with uh, medical direction and say, you know what, I don't think transporting this gentleman prone is a real great idea. Uh, make the decision to transport him supine uh, and add the, the INO at 20 parts per million. Uh, so that was our plan. Transitioned him back to the stretcher. Everything was going great. We get him back over to the stretcher. Um, once he transitions back to the stretcher, uh, the cuff leak uh, reemerges. Um, upwards of a 50% cuff leak. Uh, one of the really nice things about the ventilator that we're using, uh, the Hamilton T1, is it gives you uh, quantitative numbers for a cuff leak. You can go into the monitoring data and it will say, this is how much you're losing between BTI and BTE. Uh, and so it gives you a percentage cuff leak. And we had anywhere between a 10% cuff leak, which I was willing to sort of deal with, upwards of a 50% cuff leak and a loss of PEEP. We weren't able to maintain PEEP on the gentleman. Um, so kind of went through troubleshooting with the docs. They were like, "Can we, we can get an x-ray up here, but it's a COVID unit. It's going to be a long time. This is going to be a process. And they offered to... Um, put a laryngoscope, or actually they ended up using a bronchoscope. They ended up basically putting a bronch in the gentleman's mouth to make sure that the uh, tube was in the right place. That sufficed for me. Let's look at the, let's look at the tube. Let's make sure the cuffs below the cords, all of that stuff. It was, we were able to add more air to, to the cuff. Um, added another 20 cc's of air to the cuff, cuff leak uh, goes away. Um, so, and then it would reemerge. And the interesting thing is we were able to manually create a seal by essentially holding cricoid pressure. 
um, or at least just holding some tension on his neck. We contemplated just putting like a liter or bag of saline on his neck and just sort of said, look, let's not try and temporize this. This guy's too unstable. Let's figure out what's going on with this ET tube. So got the more air in there, got the cuff confirmed with the bronchoscope and uh, seemed to be holding fine. So we went about our, uh, went about our day and uh, loaded him up in the ambulance and started our transport. Great, great. Thanks so much, Sam. So I think as all of you can probably see, this case really starts to highlight the importance of multiple tools in the toolbox. Um, and this is one of the things we really strive for, to be able to give our clinicians the ability to choose what is most appropriate for the patient. Uh, as we talked about prior, they optimize ventilator settings, uh, determine the patient was optimized from a sedation and paralytic standpoint, uh, realize the patient met indication for proning, prone the patient, uh, quickly identified an issue, was able to successfully rapidly supinate the patient, uh, further work down the problem list of determining that the patient was not going to be suitable again for proning, uh, and then decided to go ahead with INO. So again, this case really starts to illustrate the importance of working through problems and determining what is going to be most important uh, and most beneficial for your patient. So we're going to move on from the case for a second. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Garfinkel to get a little bit more into the discussion about inhaled nitric oxide, how it works, um, what the benefit is potentially, uh, and then we're going to do a little bit of a literature review with uh, Dr. Troncoso. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, so inhaled nitric oxide is a colorless gas. Uh, that causes selective dilation of the pulmonary vasculature uh, and is delivered in line with the ventilator circuit. And really the key thing to know here is that it is selective uh, pulmonary vasodilation. So it only goes, so in the healthy areas of the lung, it's absorbed and it causes the vasodilation, which increases oxygen uh, delivery to the healthy areas of the lung, which is really where we want to increase oxygen delivery because there's no gas exchange in the, the um, injured areas of the lung. Additionally, the pulmonary vasodilation causes reduced pressures in the pulmonary artery, and that decreases workload on the right ventricle. Another really key characteristic of nitric oxide is that it's inactivated by hemoglobin. And so it's very quickly the inactivated and you don't really get any systemic effects from it. And so again, selective vasodilation just in the lungs. Now in this webinar, we're talking about inhaled nitric oxide in the adult critical care transport. It's very important to know that this is adult patients because like many medications, it's not actually FDA approved for adult patients. The only FDA indication is actually for PDF, for neonatal uh, pulmonary hypertension. But like many medications, we, we use it off label. And there's two real indications that uh, we use INO for in the pre-hospital or in the critical care transport setting. Although in this patient, this was severe ARDS from COVID, uh, which we've been seeing a lot of of the past year, of course. In ARDS, there's lung injury, and there's fluid in the alveoli, which reduces gas exchange. By dilating the pulmonary vasculature with inhaled nitric oxide, you cause more gas exchange to occur in the healthy areas of the lung, which increases oxygenation and hopefully improves your hypoxia. In patients with right ventricular failure, uh, such as from a massive PE or from acute pulmonary hypertensive crisis, you're also offloading the work of the right ventricle because you're decreasing pulmonary hypertension. And so it can also be indicated for right ventricular failure. It's important to understand that there's one of the contraindications of this medication is severe left ventricular dysfunction. Because as you cause pulmonary vasodilation of the pulmonary circuit, you're increasing blood flow to the left side of the heart. And if you have a weak left heart, then you're gonna cause pulmonary edema and you can um, cause worsening hypoxia and worsening um, cardiovascular function. Just like any medication, there are some adverse effects, although not many. Um, rarely, you can develop cardiovascular collapse in the form of hypotension and tachycardia when initiating this medication. And this is generally because the left ventricle is too weak to deal with the increased blood flow. The half-life of nitric oxide is about six seconds. Um, and so if you abruptly discontinue 
the nitric oxide after achieving a steady state, then you can get rebound pulmonary hypertension, which is going to cause hypotension, hypoxia, and possibly cardiogenic shock. Nitric oxide, when it combines with hemoglobin, causes uh, met hemoglobin. And so you can develop met, hemoglo met hemoglobinemia. And generally, after about 48 hours is where you're going to get your steady state. So you measure that, and we want to keep it less than 7%. And that's measured with a blood test. If met hemoglobinemia becomes too severe and you develop uh, refractory hypoxia, you can either decrease your nitric oxide or you can, in severe situations, give methylene blue as your antidote. Finally, uh, acute lung injury can occur in the form of cytotoxicity when inhaled nitric oxide combines with oxygen and causes nitrogen dioxide. Now, typically, this isn't going to be an issue um, as long as there's continued forward flow in the ventilator circuit. But if for some reason you can no longer use the ventilator and you have to use the inhaled nitric oxide with a BVM, then you may develop some nitrogen dioxide acc accumulating in the bag itself. So before you attach the bag to the patient, you want to make sure to purge it uh, to get rid of all that nitrogen dioxide. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Garfinkel. Uh, let's turn it over to Megan. Uh, Megan, as I said before, is one of our respiratory therapists uh, who was uh, absolutely essential uh, in developing this program and helping us roll this out in the pre-hospital environment. Uh, so Megan, why don't you get, get into a little bit about uh, INO and how it compares with other inhaled pulmonary vasodilators. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of the pulmonary vasodilators. Um, inhaled gases and medications that we, um, we use, and then some that are not, one that is not commonly used. So inhaled nitric oxide, um, also known commonly as INO, is a gas delivery for pulmonary hypertension. It's given via an injector module. And an important thing to note is it has a two to, two to six second half-life for a pulmonary vasodilator. So if it were to be shut off, um, Patients can be very responsive to having no nitric running, or it can take, take um, action quite quickly. The second one um, that most are pretty familiar with is the aerosolized ibuprostenol, also known as Velitri and um, Flolam. So it's an aerosolized medication given through a vibrating mesh nebula nebulizer, such as um, an airgen or a jet and it has a two to three minute half-life. So prior to doing transports with INO, we were doing some transports with ibuprostenol, Velitri, Flolan um, from outside hospitals in. And then as COVID came and we were transporting COVID patients, we switched completely to inhaled nitric oxide. So we're no longer using the ibuprostenol, Velitri, or Flolan. And then one of the non-commonly used but seen every once in a while is aerosolized iloprost. It's an aerosolized medication, um, has a vibrating mesh nebulizer it needs specifically to be given with, and it has a 20 to 30 minute half-life. Um, the concerns with this using this medication and why, why we choose not to use it is that it requires a lot of filter changes. It's a kind of a thicker aerosolized medication. Um, so we, we use either INO or Velitri and our drug or pulmonary vasodilator of choice right now is the INO. Great, awesome. Thanks so much for that review. Um, okay, so let's get a little bit into the literature now uh, and let's hand it over to Dr. Trancoso for a brief review of, of what exists currently uh, in the literature about INO. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ruben Trancoso. So when discussing the literature regarding inhaled nitric oxide, we're gonna go, you know, we're just gonna start at the top of one of the highest levels of evidence out there, uh, the Cochrane Review. And to catch everyone up, the Cochrane Review basically conducts very stringent systematic reviews and meta-analysis of multiple studies uh, of particular topics. And the nice thing about them is once they pick a topic, they update it as more literature is available. So this um, 2016 Cochrane Review looked at inhaled nitric oxide for ARDS in children and adults. And this was actually their third review of the literature uh, for inhaled nitric oxide. Um, and right off the bat, 
we're going to be very transparent and clarify right here, right now, that the literature does not report on mortality benefit for inhaled nitric oxide. Uh, in the Cochrane Review, they looked at mortality in any time frame, and mortality was basically identical across all age groups between patients who received inhaled nitric oxide and those who didn't. There were some key differences, though, that we can take advantage of uh, and an important negative effect to consider. So they found that although there was no mortality difference uh, between the groups, there was definitely an improvement in their P to F ratio and as well as their oxygenation index. And for those who don't operate in the PEDS world, that's what they use in terms of, um, it's one of the factors when considering uh, pediatric patients for ECMO. Um, but they did show uh, an increase in the P to F ratio and their O2 index, um, but as well, they did see a side effect in renal failure, okay? So why, so in layman terms, in their conclusion, and which is very nice because they do this for every subject that they cover, uh, you know, the way they clearly worded it, I meaning they did not split hairs, uh, they report that the evidence is insufficient to support inhaled nitric oxide in any category of critically ill patients with acute hypoxic respiratory failure. And they go on to say that inhaled nitric oxide results in transient improvement in oxygenation but doesn't reduce mortality and may even be harmful given the uh, potential increase for renal impairment. So, you know, it begs the question, why in the world would a critical care transport program who claims to be an evidence-based and best practice protocol driven program put inhaled nitric oxide in our toolbox for severe ARDS patients? And the answer is very simple. You know, these critically ill patients have usually exhausted their hospital's resources and they're being transferred to a tertiary care center that's going to try heroic measures in order to save their life. And there's no sugarcoating it. These patients are very sick. And while we would love every transport to be nice and easy, like this top line going from A to point B, we know when it comes to crashing patients that these air and ground transports are super tenuous. And no matter what we do, the bottom, the bottom line is, <laughs> no matter how we prepare, it's usually like the bottom, the, the bottom line all over the place. Um, so we try to do everything in our capability to optimize um, oxygenation prior to transports. And nitric oxide, the way we deploy it, is, is uh, meant to optimize our patients for that transport. Uh, and this is not unprecedented. Um, this has actually been shown in the literature. This is done actually by the University of Michigan's critical care transport program. They used inhaled nitric oxide, and this was in 2015. And they basically showed the same thing that the Cochrane Review showed. They showed it increased their mean uh, arterial partial pressure of oxygen, um, and they were able to safely do it. Um, there were no real side effects for, um, during transportation and upon arrival to the hospital. I think there were, oh, there was one missing slide, but I, there was a slide that basically showed uh, the huge protocol that they did for this. Um, and basically, they just like you'll hear from our protocol, they had a tremendous algorithm that they needed to, to implement prior to uh, putting out inhaled nitric oxide. So why in COVID-19 and, uh, and inhaled nitric oxide? Basically, you know, the evidence, there really isn't any, and but nobody's really anticipating uh, inhaled nitric oxide to, in, to improve mortality. I don't think anybody is. Uh, but the one thing like Megan was talking about that I know has over the other inhaled pulmonary vasodilators is that because it's not aerosolized, there's no transmission risk. Um, so the literature we're utilizing, we know that there's no mortality benefit, but we're utilizing that transient improvement in oxygenation to get the patient to the tertiary care centers where hopefully the next therapeutic measurement can help them out. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Trucoso. That was, uh... A really excellent review of the literature, and uh, I know helpful uh, for many people to understand what's currently out there. So as medical directors, uh, you know, there can be clinical practices that we would like to implement for patient care. However, making them happen and doing so efficiently and effectively is a completely different story. Um, so being left alone to even consider implementing this kind of therapy would lead me all the way to the right of the Dr. Fauci pain scale uh, with soul crushing pain. But if you're lucky enough to be surrounded by people smarter than you, uh, such as fantastic nurses and nurse educators um, like we have down here. So Sarah Beth Burton, um, Sean Troutman, Ben Quintanilla, 
then you end up all the way on the left side of the pain scale, which is where I did. Uh, and ultimately, you'll see that it was the education and training program associated with the resources that we were able to bring to our clinicians that ultimately led to the successful deployment of this therapy. So let's turn it over now to uh, Sean Troutman for a further discussion of how we went from concept to implementation and everything in between. Thank you, Dr. Margolis. Um, yeah, this is really where the rubber meets the road um, for, uh, for this therapy. So here we are. Um, we have uh, our implementation of inhaled nitric oxide, and it's time to take off the training wheels. So inhaled nitric oxide and, and other pulmonary vasodilators, obviously, uh, these transports occurred prior to COVID. Um, and uh, in that context, they were a relatively rare event. Um, Megan uh, worked with us uh, from RT, the entire RT department would work with us, and we would probably do about one or two of these transports a year. Um, and so in that context, uh, really made a lot of sense for us to just rely on RT uh, when we had to do these transports. So whenever we had a um, inhaled nitric oxide or a bleachy transport, we would call the, the charge RT, they would sort of um, rearrange their staffing. They'd pull somebody either off the floor or the charger or the charge RT would come with us. They would uh, gather their equipment, meet us in the AMBO bay, and we'd be off and um, uh, go in to, to get these patients. Um, so that really worked well. Uh, every once in a while, somebody would come up with the idea and be like, hey, can we do these transports by ourselves? And the answer was basically, there's no reason to. We've got plenty of... Uh, plenty of support and we don't really do this uh, on a very uh, um, regular basis. So there's no reason to go through all it would take to train and to, um, and to do all this um, con ed and, uh, and everything else. We'll just take RT. Well, then COVID comes along, right? And now we're seeing increasing amount of patients on pulmonary vasodilators. So we're, we're, we're having to call RT a lot more often, right? And have them come with us, which they are always willing to do, but of course it puts a burden on them. Um, and then we also saw an increasing number of patients that were candidates potentially for, for INO, um, and especially as, the, um, as the, the COVID pandemic sort of went on after a few months, uh, facilities were getting very good at the ventilator optimization, right? In the first month or two, uh, we would arrive at bedside at some of the smaller hospitals, and we'd be able to do a lot of ventilator management with these patients because they hadn't, uh, they hadn't really exhausted all their means. But after about a month, uh, all these other hospitals, they got really good at ventilator management and they started realizing sort of how they could optimize these patients. So at that point, once we arrived, uh, we really didn't have that, that patient optimization um, ability to, to sort of um, uh, give them. We then had to, um, we, we were already exhausted of our options. So, uh, so, we, so we were then bringing these patients back. We weren't really able to ventilate them or oxygenate them super well. They were low SATs. We would bring them back uh, either to here to Hopkins or one of the other uh, centers. And they basically go immediately on nitric oxide while they're uh, either, either just oxide, uh, nitric oxide or they'd be preparing for ECMO. Um, so our mission here at Lifeline is to extend the, uh, the, the reach of Hopkins Medicine uh, take, and take Hopkins Medicine to the bedside. So here we were in a position where we really could start to do that. Um, and so uh, the other problem that was also going on is that um, uh, one of the things we don't hear as much about during this pandemic, but uh, RT were the heroes of the pandemic, right? And they were super stretched thin and um, uh, uh, we had so many patients on ventilators, they were setting up ICUs that were previously not ICUs. So RT was very stretched in their capabilities. So Megan and I uh, basically had a conversation and we decided to, um, to start to do this in a different way and start to um, do these calls independently um, so, that, so that RT could focus on, on the patients in the hospital and we really could take, um, take these patients and extend Hopkins Medicine. So what, what things would this require? Well, of course, um, it's gonna require equipment. Uh, so we have to figure out the equipment. Uh, gonna require a lot of training, gonna require uh, protocols, uh, uh, so develop some protocols and how we're gonna do it. And then how are we gonna communicate these changes as we're, as we're making these big things um, uh, to our patients? So the equipment that we used, um, 
So this is uh, obviously not an endorsement for any uh, particular type of equipment, but this is what we, uh, we implemented and are currently using. So we're using the INO Max uh, module, uh, as you see on the left here, uh, that is the module that we use. So um, and, uh, Megan and uh, Pat and the rest of the RT department, they helped us to uh, secure our own um, module so that we didn't have to, uh, we could keep it in our department and we'd have it ready to go basically. Um, we had to figure out how this would uh, sort of set up on our T Hamilton T1 ventilators, which is the next picture you see sort of how we have it all configured and set up there. And then in the transport environment, it's very difficult to have all these things uh, on the stretcher, right? So um, we, we had to figure out a way that we could uh, transport with this. Um, and so these patients were obviously very sick. They're always going to be on a ventilator. They're always going to be um, with a monitor, multiple drips, things like that. And then some of these patients are prone. So where do you put all this equipment? So we came up with this setup. Um, um, even cells were working on sort of having some, some things manufactured in a more permanent basis. But this uh, setup with the bag really got us uh, really got us started and was a really good way to kind of get everything, keep it all together uh, in this sort of luggage bag here. You can see the module, uh, the inject, uh, the, uh, the, the INO module in the front there. Um, and then in the back where you can't see is we have um, actually uh, O2 holders in the back of the uh, luggage compartment where we have our um, uh, INO tank, a D tank, and a, also a D tank uh, cylinder, uh, O2 cylinder. So the training. All right. So this is where it really kind of um, really got intense. So this actually required quite a bit of training for our staff. Um, this is something that uh, both paramedics and nurses are really not familiar with uh, uh, most of the time uh, handling independently. Some of our ICU nurses maybe were familiar with uh, managing patients on INO, but really never had done it independently. So this required a lot of training and we relied on uh, a few subject matter experts that we had here in the department. We had at least three people uh, who had been on other transport teams and were familiar with it and had actually managed uh, INO independently. And really uh, sort of taking the lead on that was Sarah Beth Burton. Uh, she's one of our nurses here and she really kind of took charge um, with developing the training. And she also developed our, um, our protocol uh, and, and uh, standard operating guideline as well. So she was, uh, we really relied heavily on her um, as well as Megan Graham, who's on our panel here. Um, and the rest of her RT team to really be the experts and to help us uh, figure out uh, what we don't, what we didn't know, and where we had to focus on things. And then as it got more practical, we did lectures. So um, we do a lot of con ed here in our program, and uh, we set up in our winter con ed. Um, Sarah Beth did uh, did about an hour lecture on INO. And then she also had hands-on sessions uh, where she basically showed everybody how to do the setup. Now the setup on this device is, um, is a bit cumbersome. And so it really took a lot of hands-on practice. So she showed them in this con ed session, but then required an awful lot of uh, people practicing it. So we ended up putting, uh, putting out uh, the INO setup in our education room and we developed super users who could take people through it every day. So almost every day, people were running through uh, running through the setup. And it usually took people at least three or four times to run through the setup before they really got comfortable with how to set the whole system up. So it's just continual practice, continual practice, continual practice. And then RT continued to support us both with education, with questions, uh, reviewing our protocols and things like that. And then they also offer the support that uh, even if they're not going on a, on a call with us, if we run into trouble uh, they're always there to help guide us through. So they gave us uh, their numbers. We always had uh, Megan's number that we could call her or the RT uh, charge uh, to give us support in real time. And we started developing our protocol. So um, obviously, as has already been discussed, the indications for this, uh, really we saw this as um, definitely a bridge therapy. So uh, this is a way to be able to get the patients uh, to a place where we where they can potentially go on ECMO or get a, a, um, further further treatment. Um, so this uh, this is a protocol that requires a medical command consult no matter what, uh, because as we talked about before, there are so many different pieces and we really want to optimize first. So our medical command team has been instrumental in helping us work through these problems and helping us uh, sort of evaluate these patients to make sure we're doing this uh, in the right way. 
We also developed um, our send criteria. If you just go back one real quick, Asa. Um, our send criteria, which was discussed in our communications center. Um, one of the things that sort of was unique about this protocol also is that not only do we have um, the protocol for if somebody's already on INO therapy, but we also had a protocol to take it with us so that we'd have that tool in our toolbox. All right, now you go to the next one. So then uh, we also developed along with the continuation of INO, we have a protocol to initiate INO. And this, uh, this has happened on a, uh, uh, quite a few occasions uh, where we've gotten to the bedside. Uh, often um, some of the smaller hospitals do not have the option to, uh, to put patients on uh, inhaled nitric. So we were able to offer that and uh, increase their patients' um, uh, SVO2 and PO2 in order to get them get back to Hopkins. Um, there's also a few times uh, where we actually switched somebody from Velitri onto INO. Um, both of those times we did it with respiratory therapy uh, along with us. So then the crew becomes important. So it used to be that we would send these with um, our regular SCT team and then RT came along with us to run the INO. Well, now uh, we have this, uh, this um, therapy where we're not taking RT with us. So we decided to develop a super user type um, uh, implementation where we had these people that were trained as super users who could help train other people, but they also would be the ones that would be the expert to go along on these transports. So uh, we had a small group of about uh, 10 people who were trained as super users, and we really made sure that they were on, sh on shift every day. So there's always somebody uh, on shift that was a super user for this. And they would go along with the crew to be the super user for the INO and help direct that process. Um, in addition, that person would also be an extra person if they got to the bedside and decided proning was a more, a more appropriate therapy, they'd be an extra person to help uh, with the proning and with uh, emergency procedures for that. So the process then, once we finally got this whole thing rolled out, took much longer than, than we thought, as all these things typically do. Uh, but it required us to, uh, to figure out some processes. And uh, with this setup, uh, we kept this in our helipad. We're keeping this in our helipad so that it is a shared resource between our, air, our, um, our, our aircraft and our ground transport program. Um, and we always want to keep this mission ready. So especially if it's our air process, you know, these, these uh, pre-use checks, they're required to happen within 12 hours. So we put it as a Q shift check. So it's always, uh, so every shift, somebody's going out, checking the INO, doing the pre-op checks to make sure it's always ready to use um, at any time, um, along with making sure there's a full O2 tank in the bag. Um, and that O2 tank is there for emergency procedures. If you have to bag the patient, it's ready to go, as well as the INO tank, um, that's an adequate level of uh, PSI. And then, um, and then our launch, our launch process. So we love checklists around here. We develop checklists for our proning protocols, and and we have a checklist here as well. So our our concern here was that um, you know this is a sort of a complicated process. There's lots of different pieces. There's lots of um, things that you uh, need to gather up. Uh, so we try to keep it all together. We put little packets together of all the different disposables that would be stored in the bag with the INL. And we came up with a pre-launch checklist that everybody could uh, run through uh, just prior to leaving on their flight or their ground mission to make sure that you had everything that you need. So lessons learned. So here we are on the bike. We, were, we took off the training wheels. Now we're rolling uh, all by ourselves, right? So what did we learn? Well, initially we we really underestimated the amount of training that would be needed and the amount of su uh, support, I guess, that that our crews would need. Um, this was really a high anxiety uh, producing uh, rollout for people because they really felt like this was way out of their uh, um, way out of their wheelhouse and really required a lot of support. So along the way, you know, we sort of, we did one thing, we thought that'd be enough. We got a lot of feedback that, hey, I'm still not feeling prepared. So we, so we kind of continued that uh, education process. So in the end, I think everybody felt good about it, but it took us a little longer than we expected. Um, so that's one thing, really ensuring that. And then ensuring good communication between the crew. So as the crews, um, as you heard in this case study, uh, requires a lot of communication, a lot of changing in plans at times. So making sure that there's good uh, uh, teamwork. And uh, we use a communication style called Team Steps, which is a crew resource management uh, style communication. So making sure that is implemented. Uh, good communication with RT uh, to make sure um, 
that they know what's going on, even though they may not come with us. It's really important to let them know, give the awareness, because once we arrive back to the facility, they're going to need to have INO ready to go for us so we can switch over to them. And then continue to provide good resources for the crew and support. So we have our MDOCs, uh, our team continues to provide support for us. We've developed some, uh, some uh, uh, little reference materials, the checklists, uh, protocols, all those things. And then uh, we've done uh, actually training sessions like this, sort of round table Q&A time times with our crew. And then what we're really struggling with now is sort of how to maintain competency on this and making sure people are continuing to get hands on um, uh, and uh, um, uh, remembering all the different steps. So of course, uh, pretty much, you know, now at this point with COVID numbers being down, the number of transports we're doing with INO is decreasing. So we're just trying to uh, keep those skills up by, by continual training and simulation. Great, that was awesome. Thanks so much, Sean. I think that really highlights um, the level of detail that needs to go into trying to develop uh, and successfully roll out a program uh, and all the nuances that are involved. So now, you know, just to sort of bring you back to where we are, we covered uh, how INO therapy works, difference between INO and other inhaled pulmonary vasodilators, a little bit about the literature, uh, how we go from basically wanting to offer this therapy to the rollout and competency-based education and training program. And now we're gonna go back to the case uh, to conclude what happened and discuss some lessons learned uh, with respect to patient care. So Sam, I'll turn it back over to you for the uh, case conclusion. So just a quick uh, recap of what we talked about. This is a, a repeat uh, of the previous slide. Consulted with medical direction, decided that we were going to basically continue doing what was working, um, but we're going to prone the, prone the patient onto uh, our stretcher. Um, Proning failed uh, for a couple different reasons. Emergently supinated the patient back as a result of a cuff leak, had ongoing reoccurring cuff leaks, um, which were troubleshot and, and dealt with at the sending facility before we left. Uh, and then we decided to initiate uh, inhaled nitric oxide um, because we couldn't get him proned and also as a, uh, to combat the hypoxia. So, like I said, we we sorted out the uh, the cuff leak issue, uh, added a bunch more air to to the cuff, and uh, ended up being able to get a seal. Got my uh, quantitative numbers on the uh, on the T1 down to a. Uh, I think we were less than 5% for the vast majority of the transport. Get the patient loaded up, put it in the ambulance, and down the road. It was about a. Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we were about 40 minutes point to point, maybe 30 minutes point to point um, for, uh, for the transport. So actual road time that much, but we all know you got to come down three elevators and across two buildings. So I think we actually had the patient on our stretcher from the time we left to the time we turned over for about an hour. Um, so continued cuff leaks, um, but we were able to it's going to solidify that and uh, firm that up for the transport. Um, because of uh, the vasopressor and inotropic power of oxygenation, uh, we were actually able to titrate some of his vasopressor support off. Um, I think we cut his phenylephrine drip uh, in half, uh, in about half uh, for the transport. Um, and uh, transport went beautifully get to the receiving facility, unload the patient, no real changes, uh, except for the fact that we're rolling down the hallway um, and cuff leak comes back. So now we got this thing figured out. Uh, we'll just add some more air to the cuff. Um, our final sort of thought with this is that we had some sort of uh, small slow leak in, in the cuff. Um, but then we get up to the, the bedside and uh, Get to the bedside respiratory therapy at the receiving facility was unaware we were on uh, nitric oxide. And uh, so had said, all right, I got to go get nitric oxide. I said, we're, we're fine. We're, we're looking great on our ventilator. I got plenty of oxygen. I'm going to connect to your wall. Um, so unlimited oxygen there. I'm not going to run out of oxygen. Nitrix got all the nitric oxide in the world. We only had a, we were only on it for roughly an hour. So we were doing great. 
go to unpack the patient, very methodically pulling things apart. They are, we're in the process of moving. Um, we set our ventilator uh, at the bedside connected to the wall and uh, had multiple hands, somebody on the airway, somebody on both sides uh, and uh, move the patient over to the bed. And this is where all hell breaks loose. Um, as we move the patient from our stretcher to the bed, the uh, ventilator circuit, we think, somehow the ventilator ended up falling. Um, and of course it fell in the most unadvantageous way, shearing off the uh, bacterial viral filters inside of the T1 to the point where the ventilator was inoperable. Uh, the ventilator was running uh, because the T1s are darn near bulletproof. I've proven that over the years, uh, but we ended up shearing off a plastic ring that connects on the uh, bacterial viral filter in, in the connection on the T1. Uh, so we could not get the patient back on the ventilator. Um, so immediate loss of inhaled nitric oxide therapy, um, immediate loss of PEEP and immediate loss of O2 all in one fail swoop. Um, go ahead, give me the next slide. So I immediately go into what I, in my mind, refer to as an immediate action drill. Um, and I think this is stepping away from nitric oxide and more into a lot of what we do as transport providers, but I think it's very, very important with in, inhaled nitric oxide. I grew up in the military. I was in the military prior and then had been in aviation for a while. And these type of situations or this type of training exists in all of those forms. Um, so this is an excerpt from a military manual. Uh, it's a media action designed to provide swift and positive small action a small unit reaction to contact with the enemy. An enemy in our case is hypoxia, right? Or, or mechanical failure or the patient going down the tubes. Um, so it is something that we as a team train to do. Anybody can initiate it. Everybody knows what the other person's doing. Everybody knows that we're moving in the same direction. Um, so I immediately sort of dropped to my knees in front of the uh, nitric bag, the medic who was on the airway. And we knew the airway was in because he had positive control of that ET tube for the entire trip over. Um, so I knew we hadn't pulled the airway, but we lost our ventilator. We lost um, a way to oxygenate and ventilate the patient. So I immediately go to BVM. Um, and this is where a big lessons learned comes, comes in is because of all of the troubleshooting with the cuff and getting on the ventilator and sort of having the big leaks, we didn't go through our entire process with the nitric oxide to, we got the nitric oxide in line, it was running, but we didn't finish that process in that you add a BVM to your blender with a peep valve appropriately dialed in and you stuff it in the top with the nitric oxide parts per million dialed in already. Um, and so we ended up having to get a separate BVM that was not already dialed in and that BVM ended up not having a peep valve on it. So through a course of multiple sort of troubleshooting, we ended up getting to the point where I ended up firing up the bedside ventilator and putting them on that uh, so that we could have some peep. I ended up wiring the uh, nitric oxide in line on their ventilator with an emergency pass through backup because I couldn't sense uh, because we didn't have the appropriate connections because it's a hospital ventilator and different connections and all that stuff. So my point in this, uh, and you can give me the next slide Asa, is no one's coming, it's up to us. So I have run this scenario over and over in my head on what we're gonna do. Like Megan said, you have two to three seconds of half-life on nitric. In two to three seconds, it's gone. So you're now back to having no nitric oxide bleeding in on your patient. Um, so you can't fix things that fast, but you need to fix them as fast as possible because you're gonna get that uh, reflex break, or reflex uh, hypoxia. Um, and we immediately saw that. Uh, this patient dropped his SATs um, as low as, I think the, Scott, you'll have to remind me what we capped, what the central monitoring um, at the sending facility captured, but I think it got as low as the 30s. 
Um, it he... was it was nearly unreadable at times. Yeah. Okay. Um, so less than thirty. Um, and he immediately snapped back into AFib RBR and uh, and then started to Brady. Um, and we arrested that clinical decompensation with, or we didn't, but the sending facility physician walked in and arrested that decompensation with an entire stick of epi um, and immediately fixed that. Um, and we had gotten oxygen on the patient at that point. We, we had fixed all of our, uh, all of our losses. Um, so patient rebounded very quickly, but the, my point here is that um, in the transport environment, even in a sending facility or in a receiving facility, we're literally standing in a receiving facility, it's up to you. Um, so run these things in your mind and particularly with nitric oxide, which has such a very, very short half-life. And we talk about propofol being short, uh, quick on, quick off. We talk about some of our vasopressors, like people not being able to tolerate even a bag change in the ICU. Nitric oxide is that fast, if not faster. Um, so run the, run the scenarios in your head and practice this, sim this, um, kind of understand what your immediate action drills are when something goes wrong with the nitric oxide, because you have no buffer. So our lessons learned from this, I've talked about a couple of them. Um, when you do the prone, and I would go back to the prone uh, webinar, but when you do a prone transfer, remove as much as possible. Um, we took this guy down to essentially his A-line and his vent. Um, we were able to uh, remove as much as possible for that transfer. And that was also true going back for the emergent, emergent supination. We pulled all of his drips, emergently supinated him, and then stuck the drips back on. Um, use the tools and the data at your, disposable, at your disposal. Um, you have the nitric oxide. So there was no reason to kind of force this guy back into the prone position. Um, you've got the nitric oxide default to that or switch, switch gears to that. And that's something time, sometimes we're not great at in transport. It's kind of switching gears on what we've decided we're going to do. The other thing is you've got all of that monitoring data. If uh, you're lucky enough to have a ventilator that will give you all of the data that we're lucky to have with the T1. Um, and once again, no disclosures, I've got um, no connection. I just like what they, uh, what I'm given with that piece of equipment. That leak was very, very valuable in that I can actually see what my leak percentage is and see how it changes as we make uh, differences. I know is a very, very simple therapy. Uh, at its core, it's a very simple therapy. It's a simple therapy to initiate and it's a sim simple therapy to, to monitor as long as nothing goes sideways, right? All it is is a couple pieces that you put in line and it, it's essentially a set in and forget it machine um, for the most part. Uh, and it's a very powerful therapy with, for severe hypoxia. Um, I've seen it, I've been transporting nitric oxide independently for uh, probably five or six years now uh, with a little bit of a break in there. And um, I've seen it work extremely, extremely well and act as a bridge to, to ACMO and to Dr. Transcosco's point and other people have said it, nitric oxide is not going to uh, decrease mortality, but it gives us a tool in our toolbox to get the patient from point A to point B in our environment, in the transport environment. Um, and that I think is the most important thing that we can kind of take away from this. Um, and then checklists for that cognitive offload, we have, we now have as a result of this uh, case, a uh, pre-transport checklist and running that checklist so that you don't get sidetracked with the other 12 things that you're doing with this patient, because they're all unstable and they're all going to take your attention someplace else is run that checklist um, prior to going. And I, if we had run that checklist, we would have had that BVM in place and it still would have been an incident, but it potentially would have been a less, uh, less detrimental, de detrimental incident. Scott, did you have anything other lessons learned you took away from this? Uh, yeah, I mean, you did a great summation there, Sam. I would just go ahead and say that this was, um, you know, this was a COVID patient. You have all of the extra stuff that goes along with COVID, um, pappers and limited resources, limited staff. And as you said, nobody was coming to help us. We had to do what we had to do to, to help this patient. And yeah, nitric is a pretty simple therapy if everything goes well. 
And as we saw, this was a, a pretty much an absolute worst case scenario um, in terms of a ventilator failure and everything was perfectly smooth aside from the, the cuff leak issues and everything else. But from the nitric standpoint, very uneventful transport until the ventilator failed. I think as a team, we all jumped into action. We knew what we had to do. Um, everyone kind of jumped into a role. Um, and the, the backside of this, the patient did okay. And as a team, we had a lot of lessons learned and made this checklist um, and really kind of are falling back on our training. So this was one of my first times transporting INO. I was very glad that Sam was there as the expert super user. Um, you know, I, it was a tough one to get your feet wet, wet with, but it was an overall good experience and feel more comfortable going forward with it. Great, thanks so much guys. So in conclusion, um, some take home points. So the success of these programs really begin with screening uh, and maximizing the resources and the tools and the toolbox that you are able to give your clinicians so they can make the determination what the patient needs at the bedside. And if things change, they can then change their approach again, based on the patient needs. Uh, a competency-based education and training program is essential and a way to continuously evaluate competencies throughout, not just initially, but throughout time is really, really important. Uh, as you all saw with this case, the transport itself was very, very smooth. Um, when things go wrong, that's when you really need to figure out how safely you can do these. And the team, as you can see, I think did a fantastic job in immediately reverting to an immediate action drill and getting the patient stabilized within seconds. Um, that was a fairly detailed uh, presentation that Sam gave but in real time, the ability to detect something had occurred, um, go through the immediate action drill, put things together and get the patient back to stability was really seconds. Um, so while this wasn't ideal, I think we were able to demonstrate that when things go wrong, you can still do it safely for the patient. Um, above all of that, I think one of the things this case really demonstrated is that preparation and practice are key for moving these types of critically ill patients, but really any type of critically ill patient. You have to practice, you have to prepare, and ha that has to be done over and over again. Um, I could say this in many, many different ways, but I think it is summarized perfectly here. So many of you have probably heard this quote or something similar to it, but under pressure, you don't rise to the occasion, you fall or sink to your level of training. And that is really what was demonstrated with this case. Um, the team fell back to their level of training, uh, learned things along the way, have incorporated it into future training. And I think we, and hopefully all of you will be stronger for it. So with that, I thank you for being part of our presentation. Uh, I thank you for all the questions that have come in through the QA box uh, and the chat. And uh, if there are any other questions, I will be happy to take them at this time. Uh, and then lastly, I will put up our QR link, uh, QR code for the uh, CD credit. All right, so there's a couple of things in the chat people were asking about. Uh, one, one person asked earlier on about whether this was a, um, a ground transport or uh, air transport. This actually was a ground transport. Um, we are capable of doing this transport uh, both in the air and in ground uh, and on the ground side. Um, but uh, we have uh, just anecdotally, we've done actually more of these transports um, uh, on the ground side of things, which in some ways it makes it easier, a little bit more space and uh, things like that, but we can do both. Um, another one, uh, another question that came in via the chat, and I think this is gonna be for uh, Sam and Scott, uh, maybe Dr. Margolis, you were involved in the case. Uh, the air leak, uh, the cuff leaks that you guys were experiencing, uh, was there any kind of idea about where those came from? Was it a bad batch of uh, um, tubes? Was it due to the uh, patient's body habitus or uh, edema from SIRS? Uh, any idea about what, what that was from? I know that, I think we went back and looked and they pulled the, they pulled the ET tube like, for a couple hours after we turned over and 
they they said that they ended up taking i think it was like 25 or 30 mls of air out of the cuff and i know that we we alone put over 30 mls into the cuff um so my assumption would be that there was some small pinhole leak small um small small leak um but it could have been it could have been he had been intubated for a little while and there could have been some tissue necrosis or or something along those lines um could have been habitus i i don't i don't really know um the fact that it was a brand new cuff i think the cuff was what five hours old scott when we got it something along those lines or not Mm -hmm. even that just a couple hours old um so I, i don't i don't have a definitive answer on that Yeah, that was sort of a mystery through the whole thing. I haven't really been able to figure that out. Yeah, and we had beautiful end titles through the whole the whole trip. It wasn't like we were losing losing volumes. Um, so, and it was it wasn't like the cuff leak slowly happened. At least as far as we could tell, it would just be there and not be there. Um, so, which maybe a bot. I, I may maybe evidence of a body habitus type of edema situation, um, or it could be just that the way the, the hole was that it was being tamponaded by, by tissue. And as we moved them in and out of this, the ambulance and that sort of thing. Um, great, thank you. Another question coming in, um, sort of ground versus air. Um, Dr. Margolis, maybe you can uh, speak to this. Um, how do we decide whether we transport uh, via air versus ground? Sure, happy to. Uh, so it's really about use source reutiliz- utilization and out of hospital time. Uh, obviously, the, these patients who are requiring this type of therapy are critically ill. Uh, many of them are coming for VV ECMO, uh, and we want to be able to essentially decrease out of hospital time. So if air assets are available. Um, and you know the patient is, I would say, at least 20 or 30 minutes by ground, we would usually elect to go by air. Uh, obviously, taking into account um, what hospitals have remote LZs. So if you're going to a hospital that clearly has a remote LZ, the number of movements are going to be more uh, than if you just go by ground. Um, the ability to offer the same level of care for these patients uh, is really amazing. So that doesn't actually factor into our decision. Um, it just has to do with who is available and how long our out of hospital time really is for the patients. And of course, whether or not there are remote LZs um, with the hospital that we're going to. And if I can just add to that, sometimes, um, you know, sometimes the picture is not super clear when we first uh, dispatch our crews. And so uh, there are times when we arrive uh, um, we dispatch a ground ambulance and we may actually convert that to an air mission. So sometimes that happens as well, where we think we're going to do it by ground, we get there and we can, we, we want to do it by air. But a lot of times we can get these patients uh, stable enough that, and if they're not coming back for something time sensitive, um, you know, we can really manage these patients to the point where we get them stable and, um, um, and we can transport them, you know, up to an hour or so of ground ambulance, not a problem. So, great question. Um, got another question here about sort of um, understanding that I know fills a gap, uh, sort of optimizing the patient and getting them to a, to a tertiary center uh, for ECMO and such. But is there any thoughts on uh, sort of the o- over dependence of treating laboratory outcomes um, and causing some similar harm as we saw when we were uh, sort of over aggressive in the airway management and the PEEP management early on in the pandemic? Um, and then we realized sort of there's these happy hypoxic patients that we really were over treating. Um, so how we deal with that is there concern that I know might, might be similar in that and how do we QA the procedure to make sure we're not harming patients? Sure, I can, I can handle that. Um, so that is a, we call a tertiary level uh, or order question. Uh, you know, excellent question. Um, so a few things. First and foremost, we know that high levels of PEEP, and this goes probably back to the very early time when we were managing these patients on ventilators. Uh, We were just maxing these patients out on a lot of PEEP. Um, 
and obviously they were acquiring high levels of, of O2. Um, you know, I, there is no definitive evidence, but my uh, own personal opinion is that these really high levels of PEEP for a long time are inducing some level of iatrogen, iatrogenic injury to the patient. So the thought process is if you are able to introduce something like INO and you're able to dial back other therapies, i.e. very high levels of PEEP and super high levels of oxygen, that would be beneficial for the patient. Uh, I do not think we have enough data yet to say whether or not INO in these individuals uh, could potentially be harmful um, and whether or not we're actually doing them more of a disservice. I do think that we have objective criteria that have suited us well in the past, which is you know, our P to F ratio uh, to help sort of characterize the degree of ARDS. And that has often, again, led us to different therapies for patients, whether that be proning, INO, or ECMO. Um, without a doubt, uh, the QA process of this needs to happen. And right now, it's such a small frequency event that I think we are still building data to see you know, what kind of effect uh, this type of therapy is having on patients. Uh, but to sort of summarize it, uh, I would personally still use these objective measurements. Uh, I would still say that being able to reduce high levels of PEEP and high levels of oxygen in these patients uh, is good. And if that can happen with transitioning them to INO as a bridge therapy to BV ECMO, where you can get these parameters down even more, that I suspect is going to not be harmful, at least for the patient. But excellent question. Yeah, we are in the process of sort of taking all our patient transports and, and making sure we sort of have our own uh, record of all of them that we've done so we can follow up uh, for some of these things, um, as well as getting feedback from the receiving facilities. We have a very good relationship with um, our ICU docs and with our RT department, so they can also give us feedback when if they think that, you know, hey, we, we maybe shouldn't have started INO on this patient or something like that, they can give us that feedback also. I think the other thing that I would add to that is the guy who's standing at the bedside actually looking at these patients is it's it's not cookbook. It's not PF ratio this, do do these things. It it's a global picture of like do I do I think they need it for inotrope, vasopressor support, the oxygenation adding that, like um, are they are they hypotensive? Are they requiring vas vasopressor support um, type of things? And can I get some of these things down and off if I add this therapy? Um, so I think it's, I think that's a way to mitigate that is we train people to look at it as a global picture, as opposed to saying like, the number said this, I need to do this. Um, and I think that's the, the, one of the things that I, I find most intriguing about my role as a critical care transport nurse is I'm able to go out and critically think and look at the patient as a whole um, and then call back and talk to the medical direction staff and say like, this is what I think I want to do and this is why, um, as opposed to like calling and saying, well, this is this and the protocol says I have to do this and I'm going to try and cram this patient inside this box. Um, and I think that's, that's how we mitigate that, at least from my standpoint, as the guy who's standing at the bedside. That's a really good point, Sam. I think it brings up another discussion that we've had internally also, and with our, some of our critical care docs and RT, is uh, we've got all these tools in our toolbox, and um, particularly prone, uh, prone patients, like do we come, we get to the bedside and the patient's been optimized on the ventilator, do we prone the patient or do we put them on INL? I don't know if any of you guys want to sort of speak to the discussions we've had about that. Yeah, I can, I can handle that. So, uh, you know, again, I think whatever program you're in, you have to have good synergy communications and discussion with the receiving units that you're bringing these patients to, because if you are going to initiate a therapy, for example, INO, that the receiving facility is not going to continue, that is not going to be beneficial for the patient. Um, so that's sort of first and foremost. Second, based on your patient, their body habitus, other things going on, 
uh, that will then sort of help inform which of the therapies you want to be able to bring to the patient. Uh, I think of it as sort of a step ladder approach. And in my mind, at least, proning the patient comes before initiating INO. Um, I think the data on proning, uh, there's, we have much more data on proning um, and the numbers are good, right? It suggests proning could really, really help individuals. And obviously we've been doing even self proning for patients who are not intubated. Um, and sort of bringing them on INO, again, as we talked about, there's really no mortality benefit and it is an expensive therapy. So that is why that is often left to after doing proning, if proning can be done safely. As we discussed in this case, sometimes we try to prone and for whatever reason, proning's not gonna work. And then you go to INO therapy or whatever sort of next in your toolbox. Um, but as, as everybody has mentioned in, in Sam just said, you can't really cram people in into a specific protocol. I think you have to look at each individual patient uh, separately and figure out what is most appropriate for that patient and do so uh, in concert with what your receiving facility is going to do in their method of continuing care of these critically ill patients. Excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um... So we have another question here that I'll go ahead and take. And uh, uh, there was one actually earlier, I think I neglected to answer. Somebody asked, uh, do we add additional crew members to these calls? And the answer is yes, we have our, uh, these are all critical care transports. So we, we transport with standard of um, a paramedic and a nurse and an EVO. And then with these transports, we add an additional person to be that uh, INO super user. Uh, which leads into another question someone asked is, do we use a uh, specialized competency or training for the INO uh, super user therapies? And the answer to that is really a, a question of quantity and comfort, not so much different education. So it's the same competency that they go through, but we, we were utilizing sort of the, do, uh, the C1, do one, teach one model where um, we taught them, then they did it, and then, and, then, and then they taught somebody else. And so it was more, they just had more practice with it. They were, they did it more, more times. And then they were overseen by myself, by our educator and by Sarah Beth, really kind of to make sure that they had, um, had all the, the knowledge and were able to do it uh, 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 consistently and answer people's questions. So that's how we uh, did that. Okay, um, so Eric, looks like there's a, uh, was there a question about mitigation plan for pr prone patient arrests? I missed that question. So um, great question. The, um, we do, we cover that a little bit more in, uh, sort of in our prone policy and in uh, our prone protocol. But yes, we, um, we basically, short, short story is that we have a plan that we would at least start off uh, CPR in the prone position. Um, and there is some data that shows that it's acceptable. And, uh, um, um, and then um, after some time, once we get to the point where we think we could emergently supinate that patient, we would supinate them. But we would initially start off by uh, doing CPR in the prone position. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I agree that there, again, the literature is sparse, but it does suggest if your patient has an airway, a definitive airway in place, um, and in supinating them, you would have to move all this equipment. You can definitely start uh, compressions in the prone position with the palm of your hand uh, around the T7 area, sort of between the scapula. Uh, there's also some suggestion if you, if you read that you could put a, a sandbag, I don't know who cut, carries a sandbag, uh, or a liter of saline uh, underneath the sternum to apply a little bit of uh, counter pressure as you're doing compressions. Um, but the bottom line is if definitive airway is in place, and it's going to take a while to supinate the patient. Yes, you should initiate chest compressions in the prone position with your, uh, the palm of your hand around the T7 level. Um, and we do have that. If you want to go back and look in our prone webinar, we, we do specifically address that as well. Yep. I sent a link for our uh, prone webinar if anybody wants to check that out. That's on YouTube. Um, Somebody also made a comment uh, thanking the, the group, uh, Scott and Sam, for presenting a case that didn't go perfectly. And I think that's uh, really good to point out. Um, thank, thank them you know, for admitting those things and, and we're learning from them. And that's what we want to be as a program. And, and um, just as people, as we want to be able to learn from our own mistakes. And I always tell people, 
You know, a smart person learns from their mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes. And so um, they've actually incorporated this, uh, this um, case study into some of our training. They've been very open talking about it and uh, what lessons they learned from it. And I think it's been very helpful for our own department and hopefully for everybody else. So thank you, Scott and Sam, for being willing to talk about those things. Absolutely. Yeah, you don't really learn from situations where everything goes perfectly. So it's in those situations you, you learn the most when you can. Amazing how quickly this job will humble you. And that's where you that's where you learn the most. Megan, are you still on? Megan. Oh, Megan, one of the things we talked about yesterday was um, you feel like potentially we nitric's going to become more like a trend in in the respiratory world is that nitric might become might surpass valetri and you mentioned a couple of things yesterday that, that i think would be interesting for people to hear yeah so the reason so many of ino is used for a long time um the same ino in um, across the country in many institutions um, and the reason that the transition from INO to ibuprofenol or a different aerosolized pulmonary vasodilator were um, cost-saving initiatives um, for hospitals because INO is quite costly, um, not FDA approved for adults, um, only pediatrics and neonates. Um, so many, many places, including um, here, here, looked for ways to um, cut down on those costs. Recently, there over the past six months, there have been um, other manufacturers that have produced that are putting INO on the market. Um, so I, I foresee that INO will stay um, for it will stay here and it will stay possibly at other institutions as well. Um, it's safer. The modules are safer. They have alarms. Um, it's a gas and not an aerosolized medication, so it doesn't require med pumps. Um, so that's kind of what I see happening now. So getting the transport teams trained was was quite a, quite important for us, since we think it's here to stay. Thanks, Megan. I think that's, I think we covered all the questions so far. Is there any last call for questions? Is there anything that we didn't address or any other questions that people have they would like us to discuss? We have one minute left. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Um, this has been great for us to sort of put all this stuff together. And we love talking about our experiences and uh, how we can learn from it. And hopefully it's been helpful for other people as well. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to contact myself, Dr. Margolis, anybody on the panel. Um, uh, we're happy to talk about this and happy to, um, to discuss more, whatever we need to do. So um, any, any last words from any of the panelists? Thank you for joining. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. Take care. Thank you.